I always thought if I hadn't gone into journalism and newspaper, that I wanted to be a librarian. 20 years later in my career, uh, without going back to school, I think buying a bookstore was the closest I could get to being a librarian. Readers, I'm Victoria Wood, and you're listening to Biblio Happy Hour, the show that shares new book releases, we chat to the authors who write them, and the people who sell them. Every week, we'll share some of the new books that will be hitting bookshelves that week. We'll invite an author or two or more on the show to talk about their debut or newest release, and we'll introduce you to an independent bookseller and their bookstore so you can stop by, get tailored book recommendations, and pick up some new books when you're in town. So make space on your bookshelves, follow us on social media, and make sure you're subscribed to Biblio Happy Hour wherever you listen to your favourite shows. Readers, Biblio Lifestyle is a newsletter, community, and space for people who can't live a life without books in it. Every Friday, you'll get a special treat in your inbox filled with inspirational content, book recommendations, self-care tips, original interviews, and things we think you'll enjoy. The best part? You'll only receive one email per week, and it will be an amazing five-minute read or less. So if you're not on the list, sign up now for our free weekly delivery at bibliolifestyle.com. I've included a link in the show notes so you can sign up there. This week, I'll be chatting to bookseller Jesse Mullen from Browsing Bison Books, located in Deer Lodge, Montana. We talk more about the bookstore, southwestern Montana, what readers can expect when visiting his bookstore, and how he got involved in the book business. Jesse, thank you so much for coming on the show, and welcome to Biblio Happy Hour. Hi, thank you for having me. We're so happy to have you here. So, yeah, let's talk about your bookstore. Um, Tell us about Browsing Bison. Sure, thank you. Uh, so, Browsing Bison Books, my wife and I actually bought the bookstore. It's a small, local, uh, new and used, and a few touristy items. Mm-hmm. Uh, been in Deer Lodge, Montana, uh, as a bookstore since 2001. Mm-hmm. And the former owners actually came and they spoke to me at my primary place of business, which is the local newspaper, to let us know that they were going to shut down the bookshop. And, you know, we're a small town. Uh, There's not a lot to do in this community, and we really didn't want to see it leave. So we figured out a way to keep the bookstore open. So my wife and I ended up taking it over, and we've been running it since May 1st. Deer Lodge is a great Mm -hmm. little mountain town. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're southwestern Montana, close to ski resorts. There's a national historic site here in town. uh, great old territorial prison. So there's a lot to do if you're an outdoors person. Right. And in the winter, if you don't want to be outside, there's a lot to read in that bookstore. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Sounds good. Sounds good. So uh, give us a visual. If someone was uh, coming to visit um, Browsing Bison for the very first time, starting at the front door, what can they expect coming in? Give us a visual description as best you can. Sure. So uh, they walk in our front door, and to the right, there's either a hair salon, and then further ahead, there's us on the left. You walk through our second door, and you walk into a lot of very nice uh, A-frame bookshelves that the former owner, her husband, had built for the store wow. you know, over the last 15, 20 years. And so we keep a lot of regional books toward the front. Uh, it's a tourist area, and so we have a lot of visitors coming in from out of state to the Yellowstone and Glacier National Park. So we keep a lot for them during the summer, uh, during the winter. We usually move our local you know, fiction and yeah. light readers up to the front. Uh, then we have a huge paperback, used paperback inventory. Mm-hmm. We do a lot of trade accounts. People travel from all over, bring in their used books for trade credit. You know, in some ways, treat us like a library and you know, walk through our mystery aisles. Uh, we've got some sci-fi aisles, a lot of Western. You know, this is Montana. Right. Uh, then we've got some nice reference, a huge romance section. And a pretty decent Christian fiction section, too, for, you know, that community. And we have a significant Mennonite community here, too. So oh. we try to make sure we have a good selection for everybody in town. I know you mentioned earlier that you were approached by the former store owners about them closing and you deciding to take over the bookstore. Was this something you always saw yourself doing or was it only because of the opportunity and you not wanting to lose a bookstore in your town? It's not, it's definitely not something that we had always thought about doing. When I was in college at the University of Wyoming, I worked at the top in 
rare books library uh, and then for a short while at the local county library and I always thought if I hadn't gone into journalism and newspapering that I wanted to be a librarian oh. and so you know 20 years later in my career uh, without going back to school I think buying a bookstore was the closest I could get to being a librarian so it's been pretty exciting. What would you say is your biggest challenge being an independent bookstore owner but also what is the thing you love the most? Uh, it, the biggest challenge uh, you know, retail is a new environment for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so just the amount of time <laughs> personally in this bookstore, uh, you know, I've gone from getting my schedule at the newspaper down to about four and a half to five days a week to uh, adding on a bookstore. So, you know, I'm working pretty solidly seven days a week right now. And, you know, we're taking over the business and we're trying to grow and change a lot of things. So Absolutely. Th that's been the most difficult aspect is just it's completely absorbed all of my time. Right. Uh, so we're creating processes where we can get to a more reasonable workflow. Right, right, uh, right. The most exciting part has been the customers. I mean, being able to meet these incredibly unique and diverse customer groups that come into our store. I mean, every day I meet completely unique, different people that I don't think I ever would have met otherwise. Right, right, right. But wrapping up, um, what would you want everyone uh, listening to know about you and your bookstore? What do you want everyone listening to know about Browsing Bison in Deer Lodge, Montana? I, I would love everybody to know that we love to see them if they're passing through the region. And we're more than happy to take some time and chat with them about our bookstore, what we're doing to change and make ourselves better in this area. And we always love picking up advice from other bookstore owners. So uh, if they're in southwestern Montana, definitely stop by and we'll have some coffee and chat about what we can all do to you know, help grow our businesses and you know, make this a better industry for all of us to be a part of. Absolutely, absolutely. Jesse, thank you so much for coming on the show and taking the time out to talk about your bookstore, your town, and just everything books. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you for uh, calling and having me on the podcast. Readers, you can connect with Browsing Bison Books in Deer Lodge, Montana at their website, browsingbison.com. You can also find them on Facebook at Browsing Bison Books. If you'd like to tune in to the rest of my conversation with Jesse Mullen, the full podcast episode will be available on our Patreon page. That's patreon.com forward slash bibliofinder. To find an independent bookstore near you or when you're traveling, visit bibliofinder.com. Bibliofinder is a new online directory for independent bookstores, and they help users to find bookstores worldwide based on their current or planned location. If you're on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, please tag Bibliofinder in your indie bookstore photos. Before I get started with this week's new releases, I'd like to highlight two literary birthdays happening this week as well. On March 2nd, Theodore Seuss Geisel, better known as Dr. Seuss, the author of riotous, catchy children's books like The Cat in the Hat, was born on this day in 1904. On March 6th, novelist, short story writer and journalist Gabriel Garcia Marquez was born on this day in 1927. Now, I will be mentioning some of the books that will be available on bookshelves during the week of Monday, March 2nd. And I'm thrilled to have authors Josie Silva, Maisie Card and Jan Eliceberg here on the show to talk about their new books. New this week from Riverhead Books, Deacon King Kong by James McBride. Deacon King Kong is a wise and witty novel about what happens to the witnesses of a shooting. Also from Riverhead Books, Under the Sky by Celia Lasky. In Under the Rainbow, when a group of social activists arrive in a small town, the lives and beliefs of residents and outsiders alike are upended in this wry and embracing novel. New in paperback from Riverhead Books, Gingerbread by Helen Oyeyumi. Also new in paperback from Riverhead Books, Skeleton Keys, The Secret Life of Bone by Brian Switick. New this week from G.P. Putnam and Sons, the Land Beyond the Sea by Sharon K. Penman. New in paperback from G.P. Putnam and Sons, 
Lost Autumn by Mary Rose McCall, also new in paperback, Sissy, a coming of gender story by Jacob Tobiah. New this week from Berkeley Books, Without Sanction by Don Bentley. This is book one in the Matt Drake thriller series. In Without Sanction, Defense intelligence agent Matt Drake handles the nation's toughest missions while dealing with his own personal demons. New in paperback from Berkeley Books, My Lovely Wife by Samantha Downing. New this week from DK Books, Entertaining with Mary Berry. Favorite hors d'oeuvres, entrees, desserts, baked goods and more by Mary Berry and Lucy Young. New this week from Pantheon Books, We Ride Upon Sticks by Quan Barry. New this week from Doubleday Books, The Body Double by Emily Bader. The Body Double is a suspenseful story of a young woman who is recruited by a stranger to give up her old life and identity to impersonate a reclusive Hollywood star. New this week from Soho Crime, That Left Turn at Albuquerque by Scott Phillips. New this week from Valentine Books is a new rom-com entitled The Two Lives of Lydia Bird. And we have the author Josie Silva here with us to share all the details. Josie, welcome to Biblio Happy Hour. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. So your newest novel, The Two Lives of Lydia Bird, will be available on bookshelves this week. How are you feeling? How excited are you? Wow, um, very excited. I mean, writing a book, it's such a long process, you know, from, from the idea to publication. And with Lydia, it's perhaps been two years. So it's only now that publication is actually approaching that all of the fun stuff starts to happen. So, you know, you get to hold the book in your hands for the first time and it feels really real. And, you know, it's just unfathomable, really, you know, that these mm. characters kind of, you know, they live in my head for so long. And then suddenly they're out there and you can only kind of hope that people will take them into their hearts and, and love them and it, it is it's hugely exciting <laughs> and a little bit terrifying as well <laughs> so yeah no it's, it's brilliant it's it's such a nice point to get to in the process right absolutely so uh tell all listeners and readers about the two lives of Lydia Bird and what can they expect okay um well um it's about a girl called Lydia Bird whose fiancé, Freddie, unfortunately, is killed in a road accident. And when the story kind of opens when Lydia is several weeks past that and she's struggling to come to terms with things and she's not sleeping, so she sees her doctor and he places her on this drug trial for this new brand of sleeping pills, which work, they help her to sleep, but they also have this really kind of unexpected side effect. You know, they allow Lydia to access this kind of parallel world where the accident never happened and her life is just running along exactly as she hoped it would. She's wedding planning, she's happy, Freddie's still alive. Um, and that kind of is the beginning of the story, really. She she lives one life where she's awake and coming to terms with losing Freddie and then another sleeping life where everything's kind of following the tracks that she expected her life to follow. Um and it, it's peopled out by Lydia's friends and family and, you know, she's really close to her sister. And I mean, their relationship is just, it was just a joy to write. It's really tender. And um, she's got great colleagues and friends and really supported through her grief. And I tried really hard to kind of balance that so that there's, you know, it's, it, even though it is a sad subject matter, it's actually quite lighthearted in lots of places and, and not harrowing at all. And there's lots of lightness and lots of humour. And Lydia kind of, has these two lives running and she's pretty happy with it and then she starts to realize that the accident actually has really changed who she is and she's become more independent and self-sufficient and obviously she's had to grow up a lot and in her her awake life she's kind of a different person now to who she is in her sleeping life and she's you know she's going back and she's trying to walk in her old shoes and you know it, it's a real struggle for her. she finds they don't fit so well anymore so yeah, it's about grief, but it's also about family and love, and ultimately, uh, it's hopeful. Right, yeah. right. Okay. So what inspired you to write this story? Uh, why did you decide to put the two lives of Lydia Bird out there in the world? Well, um, it was actually an initial conversation with my editor. Um, we were talking, you know, about generally about her life sometimes doesn't follow the track that you expect it's going to and how a little decision can sometimes have these really cataclysmic kind of consequences. 
um, which is, is, is the base of the book, is that Freddie makes this decision to detour on his way from work. Um, and if he had gone his usual route, then he would have just come home as normal. But because he detours, this accident happens and obviously he's taken away. And it's all about, you know, how small decisions have huge impacts, really. So that, that was kind of the spark. Um, and I sort of got thinking about it and about sliding doors style stories, you know, where mm. what ifs and if onlys. And yeah, so that, that was the spark for it. And then and then we kind of went from there. OK. Uh, so outside of Lydia, who is your favourite character in the novel? Um, outside of Lydia, <laughs> I think possibly her sister Elle. Okay. Um, she and Lydia are so close, you know, they're real best friends as well as sisters. She's the person that, that Lydia turns to, you know, whenever she's got, she needs someone to talk to. And I'm pretty fortunate in my own life that I've got a sister who's just like that. And that certainly informed the whole sibling relationship in the book. And she's funny and she's really ballsy and she's, you know, she's the kind of girl that you really want in your corner. Right. Um, so, yeah, she, she's lovely. <laughs> Wonderful. So um, is there a particular scene in the novel uh, that resonated with you personally? I know you just mentioned that your sister helped to influence uh, that sister character in the novel. But is there a scene that you related to personally? Um, I mean, well, I'm a real romantic. So there's a wedding scene in the book that I, you know, really enjoyed and sort of agonised over that one with the you know the vows that they wanted to say to each other and and it was it was lovely to write that really joyful mm. but yeah I mean there's other smaller scenes also that come to mind um at one point Lydia has to step in and do some silent speed dating which is very unusual for her and she didn't want to do but it was actually great fun to write <laughs> um I, I love writing humor um, yeah. and it's really nice in this book to be able to put scenes in like that you know to kind of break up the the, the grief side of things so Right, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, getting into your writing process, uh, what is your work schedule like when you're writing? Oh, I mean, I work from home. I'm quite lucky to work full time now as a writer. Um, and I've just had an, an office built in the garden, which is brilliant because I can get away from the kids and the dog and my husband <laughs> and everything else. So, you know, I, I just do the usual mum stuff in the morning. So I'll get up get the kids off to school all of that stuff and then it's in the office full time you know I'll, I'll spend my mornings usually just clearing out anything that I need to do article wise and social media wise although I do try to avoid social media as much as I can because it's kind of such a rabbit hole isn't it but yeah um and then it's on to writing and I'll just immerse myself in it until the kids come back from school and I'm mum again right right okay so if you didn't write what would you do for work or as a creative pursuit Oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think I would always do something creative. I'm not very analytical or, you know, I'm, I don't think I'd make a doctor or anything like that. Right. Um, so it would always be creative. Um, I really fancy painting, actually. I, I've no idea if I'd be any good at it, but, you know, when you get those really huge canvases and put lots of colours and paint on, so... yeah. I'd like to do that. Um, and I'm hoping to take up some pottery classes over the next few weeks. Um, yeah. So I've got a, a, an idea that I'm going to love that, whether I will or whether I won't, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I, I, to be perfectly honest, I can't imagine doing anything other than, than writing. I just love it so much. Right, right. Okay. What was the last book that you finished reading that you'd now recommend? Okay. Um, well, I read a book over Christmas, which was called... Um, the 10,000 Doors of January, and that's by Alex E. Harrow. Um, and it just absolutely blew me away. The writing was just so beautiful. I just kept, you know, when you go back and you read something again because you just think, wow. It's a sort of a magical story about a girl who moves through secret doorways and into lots of different worlds. And it's kind of a real love letter to storytelling and so beautiful. And I've given that book as gifts, you know, to everyone who's had a birthday since has had that book with me. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So when you're not reading and when you're not writing, what are you doing? And I know you do the mom things, but what other things uh, do you do outside of reading and writing? Uh, oh, gosh, not that much at the moment. I'm on deadline, so I feel like all I do is get up, cook. I love to cook, actually. That's something that I do do. Okay. And I've got a couple of um, willing helpers as well. My um, my youngest in particular, he's 13, and he's a really 
good budding chef. We love to bake, so and we've recently moved into a, a bigger, older house. So house renovations takes over a lot of a lot of my spare time. So I spend a lot of time in in tile stores and carpet stores and looking at paint charts. And but I love it, so I can't yeah. I can't complain. Either. Right, absolutely. <laughs> So part of the podcast is all about indie booksellers and indie bookstores, and we love shouting them out on the show. So share with our listeners some of your favorite indie bookstores. Okay. What comes to mind for me, actually, is a place that I visit really often, um, which is a town called Hay on Wye, which is kind of a a mecca for books. You know, it's this small town that's absolutely dedicated to bookstores, full of independent bookshops and lots of antiquarian and rare books. It's a proper treasure trove for book lovers. I mean, I, I happily just lose days just kind of wandering around the lanes, dipping into the little shops, you know, the really narrow little doorways and lots of old and unusual things to find and you know lots of them have comfy chairs and cake you yes. know so you can kind of find a book find a chair it's just it's wonderful it's you know one of my favorite places on earth really so yeah I'd go there in fact I would live there if I could <laughs> I wouldn't get much done but I, I would live it <laughs> right right absolutely all right so getting back to Lydia Bird uh how do you want readers to feel after reading this book uh what are the reactions you are hoping for well I mean hopefully people will feel hopeful I think um it you know it's a lot more than a story about loss even though it is you know necessarily you know it's got some quite emotional bits and people you know might cry a little bit but I hope that they'll find that there's a lot of laughter in there as well and it's packed full of family and romance and um and and Lydia's great because she kind of goes through this really long journey realizing how strong and resilient she is so I hope that kind of when readers close the book they'll feel optimistic you know both for Lydia and just generally about life I think so Mm. yeah optimism that's what I'm hoping for optimism okay that's great Josie thank you so much for coming on the show listeners the two lives of Lydia Bird will be available in bookstores on Tuesday March 3rd Uh, thank you so much for having me it's been a pleasure Readers, you can connect with author Josie Silva at her website, josiesilva.com. You can also connect with her on Facebook and Instagram at Josie Silva Author and on Twitter at Josie Silva underscore. You can also tune in to the rest of my chat with Josie in our off the cuff discussion over on our Patreon page. She has shared how her writing process and life has changed since publishing her debut one day in December. We talk about her favorite childhood books and we also ask her about other writing and book projects she's currently working on. So head on over to patreon.com forward slash bibliofinder and tune in to the rest of our conversation. New in paperback from Ballantine Books, Lost Roses by Martha Hall Kelly. New from Random House Trade Paperbacks, American Spy by Lauren Wilkerson. Also new in paperback, Madame Foucault's Secret War, the daring young woman who led France's largest spy network against Hitler, by Lynn Olson. New from Eco Books, Separation Anxiety, by Laura Zygman. Separation Anxiety is a hilarious novel about a wife and mother whose life is unraveling and the well-intentioned but increasingly disastrous steps she takes to course-correct her relationships, her career, and her belief in herself. New from Harper Books, The Night Watchman by Louise Erdrich. The Night Watchman is based on Louise Erdrich's grandfather, who worked as a night watchman and carried the fight against native disposition from rural North Dakota all the way to Washington, D.C. New from Harper Paperbacks, Death in Avignon by Serena Kent. New from Harper Voyager, A Pale Light in the Black, a Neo-G novel by K.B. Waggers. A Pale Light in the Black is the start of a new science fiction series that introduces the near-Earth Orbital Guard, also known as Neo-G, a military force patrolling and protecting space that's inspired by the real-life mission of the US Coast Guard. New this week from William Morrow Books, 82 Days in Okinawa, one American's unforgettable first-hand account of the Pacific War's greatest battle, by Art Shaw and Robert L. Weiss. 
also new from William Morrow, Eight Perfect Murders by Peter Swanson. Eight Perfect Murders is a chilling tale of psychological suspense that tells the story of a bookseller who finds himself at the center of an FBI investigation because a very clever killer has started using his list of fiction's most ingenious murders. New from William Morrow Paperbacks, The Sea of Lost Girls by Carol Goodman. New in paperback from William Morrow Books, The Hunting Party by Lucy Foley. New this week from Graydon House, The Grace Kelly Dress by Brenda Janowitz. New from Hatchet Books, Bloody Okinawa, The Last Great Battle of World War II by Joseph Whelan. New from Grand Central Publishing, Girl at the Edge by Karen Dietrich. New this week from Little Brown and Company is a debut novel entitled Hannah's War. And we have the author Jan Eliasberg here with us to share all the details. Jan, welcome to Biblio Happy Hour. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Oh, we're super excited to have you. So your debut novel, Hannah's War, will be available on bookshelves this week. How are you feeling? How excited are you? Oh, I'm walking on air. First of all, it's been a dream of mine to write a novel for, for many, many, many years. Um, and I had a wonderful and rewarding career as a film and television director and a screenwriter. But underneath all of that, I kept thinking, I, I just, I would like to write a book. And I finally had the, the guts <laughs> to turn off you know, to kind of turn the jobs away, the television jobs yes. and the money and take time off to write the book and then to have it sell and sell to Little Brown and to be able to work with such an extraordinary editor, uh, Judy Klein, who's the editor in chief, and to have Little Brown support the book in the way they've been supporting it. I mean, it, it's 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 a Cinderella tale. Uh, oh, it just, wonderful. I don't think it happens and I never believed it would happen for me, but, but it has. <laughs> so I'm thrilled. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited for you. And yes, I can just imagine how exciting this would be. Uh, but tell our listeners, tell them about Hannah's War and what can readers going in expect? There are a number of different components that make up the book. It starts as an espionage thriller and a spy story. And then as the book unfolds, you discover one love story and then actually a, another one, a love triangle. So it has the kind of propulsion and motor of a, of a good thriller, the sensuous arc of a great romance. And it is all inspired by a real woman. I was in the library, in the New York Public Library, reading uh, Microfiche, and I was reading, you know, with great fascination, this sort of history of the Manhattan Project and the atomic bomb, and everyone in the United States had to be sort of filled in about this secret project because no one knew anything. And in the sixth paragraph, I came upon this sentence, and it said, the key component that allowed the Allies to develop the bomb was brought to the Allies by a female non-Aryan physicist. No name mentioned. But I saw those words and I thought, how is it possible that I don't know who this woman is <laughs> and I'm going to track her down because there must be such a story there. And that started me on a 10-year journey. I found the mystery woman. Her name is Dr. Lisa Meitner, and she actually discovered nuclear fission. She was the she was the first person with her partner to split to split the atom. So that was the impetus for the story. And I was so taken by her and by her erasure from history that I decided I would write this book in part to reestablish her and get her her rightful place back. So I'm going to put you on the spot now and ask, who is your favorite character in the novel? Well, that's pretty easy. I adore Hannah, who is the lead. I think that I recognized a lot of myself in her. The story that I just told you about her being erased from history is mm -hmm. very familiar to me on a kind of a visceral level. Mm -hmm. After working for so many years as a female director in Hollywood, you get used to having your contributions minimized <laughs> and, 
and a rest. And I think all, almost all women can feel that. You know, there's there are all the stories about women raising their hands in meetings with a great idea, and people sort of go, oh, yes, honey, you know, and then five minutes later, a man comes up with the same idea, and it's a stroke of genius. So I did... I did definitely really uh, feel for Hannah, both in her passion and her commitment to her work, which was extraordinary, but also in her in her dedication that the world didn't really ever appreciate. Although I I very much hope that my book will will change that. Right, right, absolutely. How long did but, it take to write Hannah's War? It took nine months to write. However, and this is a big however. I researched it for 10 years. I had to teach myself physics in order to be able to write it. And then I probably wrote at least 30 outlines before before I started, before I actually sat down and started to write. So you can say it took nine months or you can say it took 10 years and nine months, <laughs> whichever you want. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's get into your reading life a bit. What was the last book that you finished reading that you'd now recommend? Oh, I've read so many wonderful books. Let me just name a couple of them. I read Julie Oranger's book, The Flight Portfolio, which is uh, set in a similar period to Hannah's War, although it's set in France and it's about a very different kind of person, but beautifully written, wonderful book. I loved Teari Jones in American Marriage. I uh, actually read that twice. So I read it when it came out and then I just read it again. I uh, loved Susan Orlean's The Library book. Probably helped a lot. She's just such a clever and funny and sort of intricately detailed writer. But also that book is about the Los Angeles library, which burned down. And I was in Los Angeles when the library burned. So it was a uh, it was it was a subject that was sort of near near and, and dear to me. You know, I read a lot of historical fiction because I you know, I wanted to see what was, you know, what the template was for yeah. historical fiction. I liked a lot of um, Kate Quinn's work, Martha Hall Kelly's work. I love Amy Bloom, who wrote um, White Houses. Yes. Great, great book. And she was my dream. Actually, she was my dream blurb writer <laughs> at, for Hannah's War. And she wrote me a blurb. So I was, I was just so happy about about that. Um Oh, I know I'm leaving out some really wonderful books. Oh, I love this book by Stephen uh, Markley called Ohio. I don't know a lot of people who've read it. It it kind of slipped under the radar, but boy, is it good. Hmm. Just really uh, magnificent writing. I love everything that Charles Baxter has ever written. I love William Maxwell, who wrote for The New Yorker. I mean, these are books that aren't new but that i go back to you know every year or two and virginia wolf is my goddess like i say i'm sure there are many more that i'm not oh absolutely of, but, right but but that's a pretty good list I yes think. absolutely so part of the podcast is all about indie booksellers and we always love finding little opportunities to shout them out so share with our listeners some of your favorite indie bookstores Okay. Well, I live in New York so and in Manhattan. I have no excuse not to go to indie booksellers because there are wonderful, wonderful ones. So particular shout out to uh, the Corner Bookstore. They're actually doing the launch of Hannah's War on March 3rd. McNally Jackson, fantastic bookstore, has everything. You can just sit there for hours and hours and hours. I love Greenlight books in Brooklyn, in Fort Greene. And then I lived in Los Angeles for quite a long time when I was directing film and television. So shout out to a couple of LA bookstores. Skylight is a wonderful one. Book Soup in West Hollywood is great. Diesel is a great bookstore in Brentwood. I think of a couple of the ones that I'm going to be at on my tour. I'm going to Quail Ridge Books in Raleigh. They've been great. I'm going to Books and Books in Miami. Mitchell Kaplan is going to be interviewing me also. Awesome. Um, 
So I'm very, very excited about that. He was a real, a real pioneer. Absolutely. Um, in starting that bookstore, which now has something like five branches. Oh, yeah. Um, Writer's Block in Orlando. Mm -hmm. I'm going to Garden Booksellers in New Orleans. Bunch of interesting places in Connecticut, the Savoy, Bank Street Books and Cafe. And then, of course, every time I travel on my own, I'm always on the weekends looking for the local bookstore. Um, right. Absolutely. So getting back to Hannah's War, how do you want yes. readers to feel after reading this book? Uh, what are some of the reactions you're hoping for? What are the connections you're hoping you know readers might make? I'm really happy when people react to the fact that this character was inspired by a real woman and when they want to learn more about her and about this period of history. And the reason I say that is I think we all think we know a lot about World War II. Certainly in historical fiction, you know, there are many books about the Holocaust and about the camps. And this is not that. This is a book about the development of the atomic bomb which is a completely different but parallel part of the history of World War II. And it's a very compelling story because it was a race between the Allies and the Germans to get the bomb. And I'm very happy when people take away the fact that there was actually a woman at the center of that, and really a woman who was responsible in many ways for not the development of the bomb, but the discovery of nuclear fission that then allowed the bomb to be built, but also allowed for the possibility of a new source of energy, because actually splitting the atom was really understanding the truth of nature, like what, what is what is life? What is, what is this atom? Um, what is it made of? And the atom is made of energy. That that's the energy that comes out that then can be used for good or evil. So I'm very interested in people's reactions to the morality of, of that question, of what scientists owe the world. Is the pursuit of truth and knowledge at all costs acceptable? Dr. Lisa Meitner would say that it's not. Those blessed with a brilliant mind and a gift for science have a higher duty that comes before discovery, a duty to humanity. Science can be used for good or evil, so it's incumbent upon scientists to ensure that their work makes the world a better place. Dr. Lisa Meitner. The, the premise of Hannah's War, when all is said and done and when all of the investigation is over and when everything is stripped away, the truth is that one person actually did manage to change the world. That's something that I believe. I think a lot of people very cynically do not believe that, but I believe it very strongly. And I hope that people can see through this story that it is possible for a very courageous and valiant, fearless person to have that effect on the world and on, and on history. Because I have a 23-year-old daughter, and given that it took me 10 years to research this book, I've, I've watched her grow, you know, from, from 13 to 23. And I, I wrote this book in large part to show my daughter and her peers that women like this are there in history, and all we have to do is look under the sort of acceptable texts to find them, and that they do deserve acknowledgement. They they really deserve to have their stories told. Okay. Jan, thank you so much for coming on the show. Listeners, Hannah's War will be available in bookstores on Tuesday, March 3rd. Readers, you can connect with author Jan Eliasberg at her website, janeliasberg.com. You can also find her on Twitter at Jan Eliasberg. You can also tune in to the rest of my chat with Jan in our off-the-cuff discussion over on our Patreon page. She shares more about how writing for screen is similar to and different from writing a novel. She also shares her work schedule and projects she's currently working on. So head on over to patreon.com forward slash bibliofinder and tune in to the rest of our conversation. 
New this week from Lisa Brown and Company, Blackwood by Michael Farris Smith. New this week from Joe Fletcher Books, Our Child of the Stars by Stephen Cox. New from Litter Brown Books for Young Readers, The Winter Duke by Claire Eliza Bartlett. New in paperback from Litter Brown for Young Readers, We Rule the Night by Claire Eliza Bartlett. New this week from Flat Iron Books, The Yellow Bird Sings by Jennifer Rosner. The Yellow Bird Sings is set in Poland as World War II rages, and a mother hides with her young daughter, a musical prodigy whose slightest sound may cost them their lives. New from Forge Books, Blame the Dead by Ed Ruggiero. New from Tor.com, Docile by K.M. Spara. New from St. Martin's Press, Frida in America, The Creative Awakening of a Great Artist by Celia Starr. New this week from Simon & Schuster is a debut novel entitled These Ghosts Are Family. And we have the author Maisie Card here with us to share all the details. Maisie, welcome to Biblio Happy Hour. Hello, thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. So your debut novel, These Ghosts Are Family, will be available on bookshelves this week. How are you feeling? How excited are you? I'm excited. I'm definitely really nervous, you know, and everything right now feels a bit surreal because it hasn't come out yet, but I'm definitely excited. Um, awesome. I can just imagine how exciting it will be. So tell all listeners, tell us about These Ghosts Are Family and what can readers expect? So these ghosts are family. is a multi-generational family saga. Um, it begins with the patriarch of the family. Um, his name is Stanford Solomon, who is a Jamaican man living in Harlem, confessing that he used to be a man named Abel Paisley, but that when he was in his 30s, he faked his own death and he stole his friend's identity. Um, the novel, novel is kind of a panoramic view of the trauma inflicted on other family members because of his decision. It's really about how family secrets can kind of impact the destiny of people before they're born. You know, and it has actual ghosts in it they're not just you know metaphorical i wanted to add so there's a blend of um realism and magic realism oh okay so what inspired you to write this novel give us some behind the scenes details um so when i first started writing this novel i was just writing uh separate short stories and even an essay and they were kind of inspired by you know memories and family stories family folklore, uh, ghost stories I heard when I was a kid. But at first, I didn't think any of the characters were related. I didn't have the idea to set them as part of one family until later. And, you know, one day I was thinking about an essay that my mom wrote and asked me to read. It was like, I think I was in my like mid-20s. So years ago, my mother decided to redo her high school diploma. She was she's from Jamaica, and a lot of employer, employers didn't think, you know, a Jamaican diploma was valid. So she was doing um, a correspondence course and she had to take an English class. So she had this English assignment where she had to write a personal essay. And the essay that she wrote was about um, her being a kid and discovering for the first time that my grandfather had a secret family. So she was like a little girl and she was sitting in his car one day and she found, you know, these school books in the car and they had other kids' names on them that she didn't recognize, right. but they all had the same last name as her. You know, in the essay, in the essay, she kind of talked about how hurt she was. And, you know, I knew these people, you know, I just considered them my aunts and uncles, but I never knew the story of how they came to be in our family. And I never knew it was like so traumatic for my mother. So, you know, I come from a family where we rarely kind of talk about our feelings. So the fact that she, it was a big enough deal for her to write it down and actually express that, you know, her father did something that actually hurt her was so, so striking to me. And it, it became something I kind of wanted to explore in a novel. So all these, all these stories that I was writing kind of centered on that idea so I decided to pull them together oh wow okay who is your favorite character in the novel I would say actually the character Abel Paisley um even though he's kind of the bad guy in the novel he was the first character I started writing and I had so many different stories I started writing this novel like over 10 years ago so you know I've been writing his story for a really long time yeah I think he's my favorite even though he's the kind of a complicated character definitely my favorite right right okay so um i was gonna ask you how long did it take to uh write this book and you're mentioning um you've been writing for about 10 years tell us more about your process i officially started writing the book in um when i was in grad school i was getting mfa book in college in 2006 
there is like one element that started from an essay all the way in college when I was in college in 2000 and like probably like 2003. But, you know, it wasn't a short story. So I would say the novel started in 2006 in the MFA program. Um, you know, and as, as I was saying, I was just trying to write short stories that were inspired by memories or by my family. But over the years, you know, it started to evolve and like come together and the stories started to have recurring characters and, you know, relate to each other. And so I started making it a novel more recently in like more recent years. Okay. Now, getting into your reading life, uh, what would you say is your favorite childhood book? Um, when I was young, I was really into, uh, rem- the, you know, Beverly Cleary. I think that was, those were the first books. The Ramona series were the first books that I really became kind of obsessed with. Uh, also, I, I think later uh, in elementary school, I think Matilda by Roald Dahl was my favorite book. Mm, okay. And what was the last book that you finished reading that you'd now recommend? Um, the last book was Patsy by Nicole Dennis Ben, which is about, you know, an undocumented woman from Jamaica living in Brooklyn who leaves her child. Um, you know, and that was a really amazing book and it was a really kind of detailed character study, you know, a, a mother and I thought that was great. I would definitely recommend it. Awesome. So uh, part of the podcast is all about indie booksellers and indie bookstores. Share with us some of your favorite indie bookstores. Um, well, right now I live in New Jersey. I live in Newark, New Jersey, and um, I usually go to Word in Jersey City, which is a great indie bookstore, and I believe there's one in Brooklyn as well, which I haven't been to yet. So that's one of my favorites, and I also, there's a bookstore in Newark called Source of Knowledge, which is a Black-owned bookstore that uh, features a lot of books from the Black diaspora, which I love too. Awesome. So getting back to these ghost star family, how do you want readers to feel after reading this book? Um, what reactions are you hoping for? Um, I just hope that the characters feel recognizable or, you know, real enough for them to keep thinking about them after they close the book. And I guess I want them to kind of feel some connection between the characters' experiences and their own. Okay. Maisie, thank you so much for coming on the show, everyone. These Ghosts Are Family will be available in bookstores on Tuesday, March 3rd. Thank you so much. Readers, you can connect with author Maisie Card at her website, maisiecard.com. You can also connect with her on Instagram at Library Love Fest and on Twitter at DRACM. You can also tune in to the rest of my chat with Maisie in our off-the-cuff discussion over on our Patreon page. She shares more about her work schedule, what she's doing when she's not reading or writing, and we also discuss projects she's currently working on. So head on over to patreon.com forward slash bibliofinder and tune in to the rest of our conversation. New in paperback from Simon & Schuster, Such Good Work by Johannes Lippmann. New this week from Atria Books, The Body Politic by Brian Platzer. The Body Politic follows four longtime friends as they navigate love, commitment and forgiveness while the world around them changes beyond recognition. New from Gallery Books, Once Upon a Sunset by Tiff Marcello. Once Upon a Sunset is a heartwarming and charming novel about a woman who travels to the Philippines to reconnect with her long lost family and manages to find herself along the way. Also new from Gallery Books, Please See Us by Caitlin Mullen. New from Gallery Books, Scout Press, The Companions by Katie M. Flynn. The Companions is a debut novel set in an unsettling near future where the dead can be uploaded to the machines and kept in service by the living. Readers, if you need a more tailored selection of books to keep on your radar or you want to hear more from your favorite authors that we've had on the show, become a patron at patreon.com forward slash bibliofinder. For a dollar per month, you'll get our monthly top shelf recommendations of new releases that we're super excited about. You'll also hear more from your favorite authors in our off-the-cuff discussions. You'll get our full Meet the Bookseller podcast episodes, get bookish-themed Instagram templates, plus lots more. That's patreon.com forward slash bibliofinder. I've included a link in the show notes so you can sign up there. 
New from Simon Pulse, When We Were Magic by Sarah Gailey. New this week from Source Books Fire, Kingdom of Exiles by Maxim and Martineau. New from Source Books Landmark, Lost at Sea by Erica Boyce. New from Poison Pen Press are five novels newly republished by Darcy Coates. One book is entitled The Haunting of Ashburn House. The second book, Craven Manor. The third, The Haunting of Blackwood House. The fourth novel, The Caro Haunt. And the fifth novel, The Haunting of Rookwood House. All five novels are newly republished by Poison Pen Press and they're all by author Darcy Coates. New from Catapult Books, Sprint Run, a 6,000 mile marathon through North America's stolen land by No Alvarez. Spirit Run is a debut memoir of a son of working class Mexican immigrants who fled a life of labor in fruit packing plants to run in a Native American marathon from Canada to Guatemala, challenging himself to reimagine North America and his place in it. New from Counterpoint Press, This Town Sleeps by Dennis E. Staples. New from Soft Skull Press, The Ice Cream Man and Other Stories by Sam Pink. New from Tin House Books, The Last Taxi Driver by Lee Durkee. Readers, I hope you enjoyed today's show. A list of all the books mentioned in the show will be available over at bibliohappyhour.com. To shop all the books I've mentioned in the show and to find a bookstore near you or when you're traveling, visit bibliofinder.com. If you're on Twitter or Facebook, please let us know at bibliohappyhour and tag us in your post over on Instagram, also at bibliohappyhour. If you enjoy listening to our podcast, please share Biblio Happy Hour with your favorite bookish friends, share us on social media, and please leave us a rating and review. Don't forget, Biblio Lifestyle newsletter subscribers are the first to know all the podcast happenings, get free goodies in the mail, and they can enter for a chance to win some free books. So if you're not on the list, sign up now for our free weekly delivery at bibliolifestyle.com. I've included a link in the show notes so you can sign up there. Alrighty readers, that's it for today's show. Thank you so much for listening and happy reading.